All right, well, good morning. All right, glad you guys are here today. We're continuing, actually, we're ending our series that we've been walking through, uh, the Biblical Feasts. And today is, is kind of a different one because today is, is the Feast of Dedication. You may have heard it as that way, or you, better, you might know it in a better way of Hanukkah. And some of you may not realize that Hanukkah is actually in the Bible, but it is. It's not one of the Old Testament feasts prescribed by the Lord, but it is a, test, it is a feast that we see in the New Testament. We actually see this feast that Jesus went to. And I heard one commentator say, as our, or I read one commentator, he said, um, if it wasn't for the Feast of Hanukkah, we may not have, have had had Christmas. So Hanukkah really does play an important role, and we're going to see today what Jesus said when he went to Hanukkah, when he went to the Feast of Dedication, and, and how that illustrates. The, uh, Jesus was actually in Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication, during Hanukkah. Now, the, the Hebrew word dedication is actually that. It's, it's Hanukkah, and, and what it means is, is the Jewish people were dedicating the temple of God, or, or better yet say, they were rededicating the temple um, for God because what happened was Hanukkah celebrates a time in the Jewish history when a foreign oppressors had come and they had taken over Israel, they had taken over the temple, and they had turned the temple really into a, an idol factory. In fact, they had set up different idols in the temple. They started sacrificing like pigs and all that, which was horrible in the mind of Jewish people. So the, they held a revolt. The Jewish people held a revolt, and it was led by this group of people called the Maccabees, and they led this revolt, and they took back the temple. And then when they took back the temple, they said, we've got to do something. We've got to cleanse the temple. We've got to clean the temple. We need to rededicate the temple, or we need to Hanukkah the temple, basically is what they said. We need to dedicate the temple. So the very first thing they did, they went back into the Holy of Holies, and I want you to notice my miniature menorah up here. Sad, sad menorah. I went online this week, or last week, and I said, I typed in, large menorah. And this is what I got. <laughs> Many of you are finding this out about me. I'm not a very great detail person. I like the big picture kind of things. I like the ideas, but I'm not good at the details. So whenever I try to do the small things myself, this is what happens. It would have been much better if I would have delegated this to somebody who would have caught my vision and saw my vision of a big menorah here on stage, and they would have ordered the proper thing, and I would have had the proper thing up here. Otherwise, I did it. This is what we have. For many of you in the back, I looked at this from the back back there, and you can't even really see there's anything up here at all. It just looks like a blob of silver. Well, I'm sorry. I'll try to explain it and just pardon my lack of details and y'all forgive me everybody say yes thank you we are a people of grace well anyway what happened was they decided to to dedicate the temple and one of the most important parts of the temple was the menorah were, were the, the the lamp stand if you will and there was only one problem when they got into the temple and they started rummaging around they realized that there was only um, a Oil, enough oil for one day. Are y'all with me? So they've got to, to light this lampstand. They've got to light this menorah. They've got to light this, and, and it's got to, to, to be consecrated to God. But there was only enough oil for one day. And it takes seven days. It takes a week to consecrate oil, to, to make this oil holy in the sight of God. So they were like, what are we going to do? So they, they kind of decided that we have two choices. We can go ahead and light the, the lampstand. We can go, go ahead and light the menorah and, and just hope that it stays lit for as long as it can. Or we can wait a week until after we consecrate oil and then we can dedicate, rededicate the temple. So they kind of met and they had a conference and they gathered all the people. Let's figure out what do we want to do. And they decided this. We don't want to wait to dedicate the temple. The temple must be rededicated now. We don't want to wait a week. Let's dedicate it now, and let's just hope that it lasts for as long as possible. So they lit the menorah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they lit the menorah, and here's the cool thing. God provided a miracle. God provided a miracle, and for eight days, for seven more days, for eight days, the lampstand remained lit. So they celebrate Hanukkah as a celebration of lights. You may have heard it is this way, as a celebration of lights. And they come and they light 
each candle, they light each light, skip one, they light each light as a celebration for the seven days, eight days altogether, that God performed a miracle, that God allowed one day's worth of oil to last eight days. What a miracle took place. Praise God, he's good. He allowed the lampstand to be lit when there was only enough oil for one day to be lit for eight days. God is good. So they celebrate that. They remember that. They remember the time that God allowed the temple to be dedicated, that God allowed the temple through a miraculous event, through the, the, the oral lasting eight days, they celebrated this miracle. And they still celebrate this miracle today. I mean, y'all hear Happy Hanukkah now. Don't y'all hear that on the TV and on driving down the road? Happy Hanukkah. Happy, pray, happy miracle of the lamp. <laughs> the, the, the festival of lights. Well, Jesus actually went to Hanukkah. If you've got your Bibles, turn to John chapter 10. And you're going to see Jesus. And Jesus is in here. And, and miraculously, again, they're celebrating these miracles. They're celebrating these lights. They're celebrating all these things. I want you to keep these themes. Now, if you've noticed over the past six weeks, there's one central theme I've been saying over and over. God is a God of pictures. Do y'all remember me saying this? Everybody shake your head if you remember this. God is a God of pictures. He loves to illustrate things to us through physical pictures. Uh, listen, I'm a visual learner. So this is so much, this is so helpful to me. I'm a visual learner. I love learning by seeing things. You can stand there and lecture to me, and you know what's going to happen? It's usually going to go one in one ear, out the other. Ask my wife. This is what she knows this to be true. But if you show me something, you allow me to see the picture. You allow me to see. Then it sticks with me. I mean, I'm in it. I know it. I've got it. I'm a, I'm a visual learner. I love to see pictures. That's why I kind of preach that way too. I love to use pictures. I love to use illustrations. I use, love to use baby menorahs. You know, <laughs> I love to use pictures and things so that you can actually see things and understand things. That's why we, we had a cross up here for several weeks. That's why we had a doorpost up here. That's why we use these rocks. That's, we do all these things basically because that's how I learn. And I'm just like, that's if, I, if it's good for me, I'm going to make you learn like I learn. So stick with me. So you're in John chapter 10. Have you found it yet? Hope you have found it. If you had not found it, it'll be, on the scripture, it'll be on the screen as well. But in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 22, listen to how it starts. It starts by saying this, Then the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem. Now, I've already told you that this is the same feast as we know it as Hanukkah, okay? The festival of dedication, the feast of dedication. It's taking place in Jerusalem. And I love this last part. And it was winter. Now, listen. It's not winter here in Missouri right now, is it? Man, it's hot. I told somebody earlier, I brought the Georgia winter up to Missouri, and now you're experiencing winter like we're used to. So it's just normal to me. For all you other people, like, man, it's hot. You know, so it's cold to me. It's like wintertime to me. But anyway, so the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Now, again, it was, it was winter. It was miserable. It was rainy probably it rained all the time in winter in Jerusalem so and you're going to notice where Jesus was in just a minute in verse 23 it says Jesus was walking in the temple complex in Solomon's colonnade and this and this is what happened so this is like a covered porch and again what did I say in winter time it rains a lot so I can just picture Jesus just walking like I'm not an idiot I don't walk in the rain I'm gonna walk under the porch so he's walking under the porch and he's just hanging out doing his own business celebrating this feast celebrating this festival then all of a sudden verse 24 happens and, and something interesting happens it says then the Jews surrounded him now this is not just a, a, a casual conversation that these people had I love the Hebrew I mean or the Greek here it actually means like they, they pinned him up they hemmed him in, if you want to use that word. I mean, they, they pinned him up. They hemmed him in. If you can kind of picture, he's walking under this, and all of a sudden the Jews surrounded him. They hemmed him up. They pinned him in. They kind of, they kind of barricaded him. He couldn't move. And it's almost like they were all in his face. And listen to what it says. It says, they surrounded him, and they asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? Listen, we want to know something. How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, let me back up. I want you to understand the Jewish mindset at this time, okay? The Jewish mindset, the Messiah was going to come, and the Messiah was going to free them, liberate them from the rule that, uh, 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 that the Jewish people were under. 
Now remember what festival we're celebrating. We're celebrating the festival of dedication. We're celebrating Hanukkah. And what Hanukkah was all about was the Jewish people being liberated. Again, they were under control of a foreign deity. And in Hanukkah, in the Feast of Celebration, the Maccabees came and liberated Israel. So they were celebrating. We're free. We're free. And now they're under authority again. And you know what they're looking forward to? We want somebody to come free us. We want somebody to do what they did back in the days of the Maccabees. We want somebody to do what they did back in the days of the Feast, the feast of Dedication. We want somebody to free us. Are you this man? Tell us plainly. We want to know, are you this man who's going to come free us? That's what they wanted to know. And I love Jesus' response. Jesus says in verse 25, he's like, listen, I did tell you. I've told you and you hadn't believed me. Jesus answered them, the works that I do. I love that word works. It's really the miracles. The miracles that I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe me. Now again, remember Hanukkah. It was a celebration of what? Miracles. It was a celebration of a miracle, right? It was a celebration of a miracle where God had taken one day's worth of oil and made it last eight days. And here Jesus is saying, listen guys, you want to talk about miracles? We're celebrating miracles? I've been performing miracles all in front of you. I've been doing miracles. And you still haven't believed me. These miracles that I perform, they testify about me. Again, I think this is so cool that all of this is taking place during the festival of dedication. They're celebrating miracles, and Jesus is saying, the miracles I've been doing, right in front of your face, and you've just not believed me. Why haven't you believed me? Jesus goes on and tells them. But you haven't believed me because you're not my sheep. My sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Now it kind of takes a turn here, and it says, and the Jews picked up rocks. Now they're getting ticked off. Now they're getting mad because he, Jesus just proclaimed himself to be God. So the Jews picked up rocks, and they were getting ready to stone him. And Jesus replied, I've shown you many good works from the Father. Again, this miracle thing. Which of these works are you stoning me for? We're not stoning you for good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Isn't it written in your scripture? I said you are God's. If he called those whom the word of God came to God's and the scripture could not be broken, do you say you're blaspheming? And the one the Father set apart and sent into the world because I said I am the Son of God. If I'm doing my Father's works, don't believe me. Or if I'm not doing my Father's works, don't believe me. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you'll know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Yeah, they were trying to seize him, but... He eluded their grasp. He kind of did a Houdini thing, and I don't know, kind of neat. So let's look, and let's figure out what can take place here. What can we learn about this? And I want to talk about first is there's this problem that we see. And here's the problem that we see in this story, the, the problem that we see. And the problem is that the Jewish people just simply didn't believe. You see, that's the problem. The problem was that Jesus told them who he was. Jesus showed them who he was. Jesus said, listen, here's the truth. What are you going to do with the truth? And they just simply didn't believe. You know, listen, this is so true today as well, right? This is so true today. You and I have a choice. You and I have a choice to believe this word of God. You and I have a choice to believe the Bible. You and I have a choice to believe Jesus. Or you have a choice to not believe. We still have this choice today. And there are people who make this choice every week. There are people who come to church and listen to preaching, listen to teaching, and you know, you know the gospel, you know what you need to do, and still there are people who don't believe it, and they walk out. There are people right now who aren't in church, right? There are people who are our neighbors, people we work with, people we go to school with, and they just simply do not believe. Don't believe. And, and, and that's really the, the problem that we're going to see. 
Well, in this verse of Scripture, I think Jesus answers two questions, and I want to answer these questions with you today, and then I want to give you the solution. The first question Jesus answers is this, how can we know? How can we know that we're saved? I mean, I don't know if you've ever asked that question before. I have. I've asked that question a bunch of times. How can I know? How can I really know if, if, if this decision I made? How can I really know if I'm following? How can I really know that I'm saved? I want assurance. Wouldn't you love to have assurance this morning? I hope that you do. I want to have assurance. How can I know that I'm saved? Well, Jesus actually tells us, I think, in the Scripture how to know that you're saved. In fact, he tells us three things. Y'all ready? Here's the first thing Jesus says. The first thing he says is, listen, if you want to know that you're saved, my sheep hear my voice. He says, my sheep hear my voice. In other words, they're drawn to what Jesus has to say. They're drawn to his words. Jesus says, this is what happens. My sheep, they hear my voice. I've heard someone say, I I was listening to a a sermon this week, and it says, listen, don't say that you haven't heard from the, that, listen, I just never hear the Lord speak to me if you don't read your Bible. The way the Lord speaks to us is through the Word of God, through the Bible. So don't sit there and say, listen, Jason, I never hear God. He never speaks to me. My first question would be, well, are you reading your Bible? And most of the time I have people say, well, I just don't have time, or I just don't understand it, or they make these excuses. Well, I can promise you this, you're not reading your Bible, guess what? You're not hearing from God, okay? Here's the thing, you, we hear from God through his word, and his word is written to us. And he says, my sheep, they hear my voice. There's a hunger to hear from God. There's a desire to hear from God. There's a desire for us to, to get into his word. This is one test, one, I guess, a, a, a marker for us. If, is, am I really saved? Do you have a hunger to hear from God? Do you have a desire to be in his word? There, there's a long for it. There's a, a desire. You, you want it. You desire it. You need it. I want you to really ask yourself this. Do you long for God's voice? Are you getting into his word? Well, Jason, I just don't understand it. Get into it. Read it. Be involved with it. There's this, there's this aspect of being drawn to his words. My sheep hear my voice. You notice this about you know, animals. You notice this about children even. You can call my son. You can call my kids. Or I can call my kids who they listen to. They better listen to me. I'm jerking not in there yet. Anyway. But, you, you know, we, animal, I mean, they hear my voice, and they come to the shepherd. The sheep come to the shepherd. They're drawn to the shepherd. They're drawn to him. We're drawn to God's word. Well, here's the second one. I don't want to spend much time on it because I've got a lot to go with. The second one Jesus said is Jesus says, and I know them. I love this. He says, I know them. We kind of have this sense of belonging. You see, this, this is all right there in, 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 in verse 20. Well, let me find out what it is. Verse 26 and verse 27, Jesus says, But you don't believe because you're not my sheep. In verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. Jesus says, I know them. This is another way we, we know that we're saved as we have this relationship. Jesus says, I know them. There's a relationship that's going on. When we read Scripture, when we come to church, when we sing these songs, we feel the presence of God with us. Here's a test. How do I know am I saved? Do you feel the presence of God with you? It says he knows them. There's a presence there. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. You put that on the screen for me. I I love this verse. It's a real personal verse for me. And the Bible says this. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that his spirit testifies with our spirit to prove, to show, to know that we are God's children. Why this is such an important verse to me and a personal verse to me is is my uncle. My uncle is actually a pastor in Mississippi. And my uncle, he was pastoring a church. And some of you have heard me tell this story before. But my uncle, as he was pastoring this church, he was practicing his sermon with his wife. See, that's what you get to happen when you're a preacher's wife. You get like to have the sermon practiced at you, but he was practicing the sermon with his wife. His, his wife was vacuuming the house, and while she was vacuuming, he was preaching. That's kind of how I feel a lot of times, you know, people do, doing other things while I'm preaching. 
But she was vacuuming while he was preaching, and he was preaching on this passage. And, and, and when he came to this passage, and he began to explain that God's Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are his children. She cut the vacuum cleaner off, and she said, wait a minute, what? And he began to explain it again. God's Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are God's children. And she said, wait a minute, I don't understand that that's not... That's never happened to me. God's spirit and my spirit, I've, I've never had that. But now listen, this is the preacher's wife. She was teaching Sunday school. She was in charge of the WMU. And yet she sat there in the living room with a vacuum cleaner and said, I'm stopping right now because I realized I've never been saved. I've never had a relationship with God. I've gone through the motions. I knew the facts, but God's spirit and my spirit has never met together, and I don't know that I'm a child of God. So my uncle sat in his living room floor, led his wife to the Lord, baptized the preacher's wife a couple weeks later. I want you to ask yourself, listen, do you know that you have a relationship? Here's what Jesus said in, in John chapter 10. I know them. I know them. That's a relationship, isn't it? Do you, are you here this morning, and does Jesus know you? Hey, Jason, does he know you? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Listen, I don't want you to be like my aunt, who was teaching Sunday school, but lost. Don't be like my aunt who is leading the WMU, but going to hell. I want you to ask yourself, to, does Jesus know you? Is there a relationship? And if there's not, I'm begging you today to have that relationship, to begin that relationship, for you to, to join with Jesus. Let his spirit and your spirit bear witness with one another, testify with one another that you are God's children. So the first thing that we know we're saved is that we hear his voice, okay? The second thing we know that we're saved is that he knows us. And there's a third thing here, too, and it says this, in verse, again, verse 27, and it says, and they follow me. It says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Here's the third test. The third test for us is that we follow him, we obey him. How do we know that we're saved? Because we have this desire to obey him. We have this desire to follow him. We know what the Bible says, and we do what the Bible says. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. We still make mistakes, but it does mean this. It means we're growing. It means we're moving to become more like Jesus. The problem I have with a lot of people is that they're the same spiritual level as they were when they were you know, 20 years ago. If you're at the same spiritual level you were 20 years ago, you might want to ask yourself, why is that? We're con continually to be growing. We hear what the Word of God says. We obey what the Word of God says. We follow Him. This is what He says here. A test for our spirituality. A test. Are we really saved? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. And then He moves into a beautiful passage. One of my favorite passages. One of my favorite passages of Scripture because here's what it says. It answers the second question. The second question that I want to address this morning is this. Okay, if we know that we're saved, how do we know that we're always saved? How do we know that we're always saved? Maybe you know it this way. Wait a minute, Jason. I might lose my salvation. Well, listen to what Jesus says. Just don't take my word for it. Just listen to what Jesus says here. Go on and listen. Let's see what he says. In verse 28, I love verse 28 and 29 of this. Verse 28 says, listen, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish ever. No one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So that leads to this question. How do we know that we're always saved? How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm always saved? Well, Jesus says three things here as well. First thing is this. He says this. I give them eternal life. What kind of life? I give them life until they make a mistake. Is that what he said? 
I give them a life until they mess up, right? I give them a life until they fall away. Is that what he says? He says, I give them what kind of life? He says, I give them eternal life. Now, this is the pre- present indicative tense, if you're, some of you guys love that or whatever. It means that he keeps on giving us this life. It's constant. It's continual. It's eternal. It's not a, oh, I'm going to give you this life until you mess up. I'm going to give you this life until you commit this amount of sins. I'm going to give you this life for 20 years. I'm going to give, he says, listen, I give you eternal life. In fact, then secondly, he says this, and they shall never perish. Ever. It's actually emphasized there in the Greek. They shall never perish. Ever. John 3.16. We all heard this before, haven't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Why? Because he gave his son. His son's gift is enough. His death on the cross satisfied that. So we can have security because of Jesus' death. He says, I give them life. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, ever. That's why, listen, we can face death with hope. We can face death with assurance. Death is scary. Nobody wants to die. But when we come face to face with death, we can be okay with it because Jesus has this beautiful promise. He has a promise of eternal life. He has a promise of not perishing ever. He has this great gift for us. It's one of the greatest promises of God. And if we don't have this security, if we don't have this assurance, then we either live in fear or we, or we live in, in trying to, to be so good all the time. We live in works-based. And you can't live in fear and you can't live in works-based because it's only grace that you've been saved. It's by grace and not of ourselves. It's not how good you are. It's by grace of God. And he gives us this gift of eternal life forever. In fact, and then he says, and if some of you have a trouble with this, well, listen to this next one. He says, and nobody can snatch them out. Listen, I love this verse, verse 28. And nobody can snatch them out because we're guarded. He says, listen, you're guarded. You're protected. You're protected. I'm holding on to you. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand. Or in case you thought that Jesus wasn't strong enough, he says, nobody can snatch them out of my Father's hand. He says, let me put a little added protection on this. Let me give you a little more assurance. I'm holding you, and the Father's holding you as well. We got you. We are holding on to you. And I love that he says, nobody's bigger than my Father. No one's stronger than my Father. No one can snatch you out of my hand. Now, again, this is kind of a, 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 a hard um, Doctrine for some people to believe. And then, you know, as Baptists, they always, oh, y'all believe in once saved, always saved. Well, as long as you got the first part right, the once saved part, I do agree with that. The problem is a lot of people don't get the once saved part right. They were never saved in the first place. That's why they're falling away. That's why they're acting a fool. That's why they're doing They never got the once saved. But if we're truly saved, what's the Bible say here? He's what? He's holding us. He's got us. And no one is going to do what? snatch us out no one is going to take that away no one is going to get rid of that in fact I Dr. Harry Ironside was preaching this theme one day of about the safety and the security of the believer and a woman came up after him and said to him I just don't agree with your doctrine it's kind of harsh with him a little bit and he said well what don't you agree with well I don't agree with this once saved part this always saved part she replied And he said, well, let me read that verse. He says, oh, I know what verse you're going to read. You're going to read that that verse about Jesus snatching you out of hand. I know what you're going to read. You're going to read John 10, 28, aren't you? And he says, as a matter of fact, that is the verse I'm going to read. And he read that verse. And then he says, now, I want to to, to, to ask you a question. Do you believe that verse? And she says, not according to your interpretation, I don't. So he said, well, let me change it up a little bit. Do you, do you believe it this way? Suppose I read it and it says, he gives them eternal life for 20 years and they shall never perish for 20 years. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Would you like that? No, I don't like that. Well, what if I said this? Let us say 40 years. Would they be safe for 40 years? 
Well, yes, if, if, if he's got them in their hand, they'll be safe for 40 years. But it goes on, he says, well, it doesn't matter if it's 20 years or 40 years. It says that they shall never perish ever. If you're okay with 20 years, if you're okay with 40 years, why aren't you okay with eternity? God says, no one will ever, never snatch them out of my hands. And she looked at him and she said, I know, where, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to trick me. <laughs> he says, no, I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. And she says, well, I don't like your interpretation. She just stuck with that. And I love how he ended. He said this. <laughs> I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get it right. He says, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And so is a woman. <laughs> Sometimes she's as bad as a man. So listen, I, can't, I probably won't ever be able to ch change your mind if you don't believe this, but I want you to walk in assurance this morning that God has you. God holds you. How can we know that we're saved? My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. How can we know we're always saved? He goes on, and what does he say? He says, I give them eternal life. What kind of life? Eternal life. And they will never perish, ever and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Listen, underline it in your Bible if you want to, whatever. This is a beautiful verse of Scripture, a great verse of Scripture, a Scripture we can hold on to, a Scripture we can live with. The problem was that the Jewish people heard this, and you know what? They did not believe. What was the problem? They did not believe. So let me jump now and finish this with a solution. What's the solution to us this morning? If, how, how do we believe this morning? Well, my candles are all burned out over here. It's because I bought the baby menorah. But since they're all burned out, I can move it around now a little bit and talk a little bit about it. So if you'll notice this, this is different than the lampstand that's in the Bible and the Old Testament. And that's because this has nine candles. Eight candles for the eight days that the lamp oil lasted. But then there's this one candle right in the middle. And here's what the cool thing is. They call this candle the servant candle. And the reason they call this the servant candle is they light that candle first. And after they light that candle, its job, it only has one job. The servant's candle job is to light the remaining candles. So you light the servant candle. And then I did it wrong because I had to glue these things in here. Because not only did I buy the wrong menorah, I bought the wrong candles. But... <laughs> So, so you got the middle candle, which is the servant candle, and its job is to light all other candles. Are y'all with me on that? Its job is to light all other candles. I want you to hold on to that thought as I introduce this next, this next solution to us. Because here's the solution. If our problem is not to believe, how do we make people believe? How do we encourage people to believe? And here's, again, Hanukkah is the festival of lights. And during the same festival, Jesus teaches this. You are the light of the world. So our solution is this, to let our light shine. I want to encourage us during this holiday season, during this Christmas season, or would I say this, I want to encourage you during this Hanukkah season, to let your light shine. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us this. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this. The Lord does not delay in his promises, as some understands delay, but he's patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. I love this verse because here's the truth. Jesus' desire, the Father's plan, His purpose is for all people to know Him, right? Do y'all believe this? God's desire is for people to be saved. There are people in this congregation right now, you're not a believer. Let me, I want you to hear this. Jesus' desire is for you to believe in Him, for you to be saved. His desire is for you not to perish. God is not a God who's in there saying, I can't wait to send them people to hell. No, God wants you saved. God wants you in heaven. His desire is not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. There are people right now in Kirksville, your neighbors, your friends, your family members, the people you work with right now, if they die today, they're going to perish. But that's not God's desire. He doesn't want that. 
He wants them to come to repentance. He wants them saved. So if that's the case, what does that mean for us? Well, he wants us to be the light. Again, Jesus is at this feast, and later in another verse in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, listen to what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, Listen, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything. It's to be thrown out and trampled by man. And then in verse 14, he says, Listen, you guys are a light of the world. You are a light of the world, a a city situated on a hill that cannot be hidden. Our purpose is this. Jesus says, you are the light. Go shine. Verse 15, he says, no lights, nobody lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lamp stand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. Y'all know the, y'all know the song? This little light of mine. Y'all know that? I'm going to let it shine. Right? Y'all know that? What's, what's one of the parts? Hide it under all. But no, I'm going to let it shine. Listen, that's what this verse is talking We are a light. We are a light in a darkened place. We are a light in a darkened place. I saw this so true in India. When we were in India, let me tell you, it was dark in India. It was just spiritually dark in India. There were idols. There were temples. There, were just, it was, it was, there was just evil there. It was dark. Let me just talk about this. It's dark here, isn't it? It's, you, you guys are in the world, right? It's dark here. We live in a place of spiritual darkness. We go to work where there's spiritual darkness. We go to school where there's spiritual darkness. We, we come to, there's spiritual darkness. There are people who do not believe it's spiritually dark. And Jesus says, that's why you are here, to bring light. It is my job, it is your job, it is our responsibility to bring light into darkness. This Hanukkah season, this Christmas season, I want to encourage you, I want to invite you to bring light. To bring light into the darkness. Bring light into your neighborhood. Listen, my little girl, she's about to be two, she loves the Christmas lights. One of the words she can say now is lights, lights. And everywhere we drive, especially at night, I hear it over and over and over. Lights, lights, lights. (sighs) Y'all should ride with her. Gray, my other two-year-old, he loves the Christmas tree for various reasons. One, he loves pulling things off the Christmas tree. <laughs> Another thing Gray loves, whatever, when we wake up in the morning, we cut the Christmas tree off as we go to bed, and then when we get up, he's always the first one up. We bring him downstairs, and he runs to the Christmas tree, and he says, It's broke! It's broke! It's broke! <laughs> and he wants us to cut the lights on. He knows the tree is supposed to be lit. So we cut the lights on, and he says, Yay! So easy. We are the light in a darkened place. And there are people who need to see our light. There are your neighbors who need to see not the lights on your house. They need to see the light from your life. There are your family members who don't need to see your Christmas tree lit up. They need to see you lit up. Are you being the light to the world God has placed you in? Let me give you a few more verses. I love this. One example is John the Baptist in John chapter 5, verse 35. It says, John was a burning and shining lamp. And for that time, you were willing to enjoy his light. Isn't that a a cool description of somebody? He was a burning and shining lamp. Lamp. I'm just wondering, listen, are people seeing your light this Christmas? Hanukkah is a celebration of lights. It's the festival of lights. Listen, we should be the light that they see. Another reason we're to do this is because 
we're called to. Y'all know Romans chapter 1? Romans 1.16 says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. We are lights. And listen, the, we cannot be ashamed. We must not be ashamed. We must go and we must shine brightly. Shine brightly. Matthew 5, 16, we know this. Let your light so shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Again, are people seeing this light for you? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Are we going to let it shine? Are we going to let the people see us? Are we going to be lights to the darkened world? I want to close with one more verse. I love this. It's found in the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 12. Listen to Daniel 12, 3. Many of you may not even know this verse. It's a great verse to memorize, a great verse to hold on. It says this, those who are wise. Y'all check that. How did it start off with what? Those who are what? You Would you like to be wise? <laughs> those who are wise will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens. I call those stars. Listen, we need some wise people who are shining like stars. And, those, and, and what do those people do? And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The people who are lights, who lead people to the Lord, are the stars shining bright. The wise person is the soul winner. The wise person is the evangelist. The wise person is the one who at school or at work or in the neighborhood are shining the light of Jesus wherever God has placed you. So I told you, we're in a dark place, right? Charles, will you help me out? We're in a dark place, but we're called to be lights. I wonder if you'll help me this morning. I'm a visual learner, and down front, I have some lights, and I want to ask you to do something with me. I want to ask you to make a commitment with me during this Hanukkah, Christmas season. I want you to make a commitment to be a light. To be a light in this dark world. Have you ever thought of this? There may be people that you know. And the only way that they're going to hear the gospel is not by me preaching but by you giving it to them. There may be family members that you visit with this holiday season. And this may be the last holiday season that you have with them. And without your light, they may never know Jesus. You may have neighbors that you visit with, that you're friendly with, but they're lost. And without your light, they're going to perish. So will you join me this week, this holiday season, to be lights that we're called to? You see, we're called to light the world. Now, my one little light doesn't do much, does it? But what happens is you can get some power from my light, can't you? So come up here a second. I'm going to use you as illustration. Everybody watch because this is what you got to do. I want you to get your light and light it off of my light. Yeah, you, you, you put my light out. That's what happens sometimes. They put people's light out. There we go. Now we have two lights. 
And what happens is if we start sharing our lights, all of a sudden you're going to see in just a minute when I cut all the lights off, how we can light up the world. So I got a, I got a, I got a fire extinguisher right there. We done checked, dude. I so appreciate that, but we got it. Fire extinguisher right there. We're okay. Listen, we burn this place down. We'll build a new one. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> but I want you to listen to me. As you're doing this, we make a commitment. God, I want my light to shine. I want my light to shine this week. I want my light to shine the next two weeks. Just make a commitment. Maybe you have somebody in your mind. Maybe you've got a neighbor in mind. Maybe you've got a coworker in mind that you need to share the gospel with. Listen, I'm a visual learner. I just need to do this kind of stuff. If you don't like it, sit where you are. Don't get up. But I want to invite you in just a minute to stand while the music's playing. Just come, let's fill this place with light, okay? Fill this place with light. Bow your heads with me. Let me pray for you. Father, I just want to pray right now for really this season, this season of Hanukkah, this season of Christmas, this season where we are called to be lights in a darkened world. And God, may we be committed to follow you. May we be committed to obey you. Father, if there's people here today who are not saved, they do not know right now that they're saved, may they make a choice right now. May they make that decision to follow you. God, those of us who are saved, may we make a commitment to be lights to the world, lights in our community. God, we want to see Kirksville changed. Use First Baptist Church to do it. Use we, the people of First Baptist, to go throughout Kirksville, to go to our neighbors, to go to our co-workers, to go to the people that we go to school with and share the gospel and let people make a choice. Yes, I believe. Or no, I don't. Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So Charles and I are going to be down front, and we want to pray with you. Maybe you have a decision to be made. If you have never asked Jesus to be your Savior, if you're not saved, Listen, I'm going to be down front. Charles is going to be down front. Come to us, and let's help you. Maybe we want to lead you. We want to talk to you. Maybe you've got questions. Maybe you're like, listen, Jason, you do some weird stuff, but we like it. We want to join this church. We want to follow. The, you want to join the church? Come talk to Charles and myself. We'd love to help you. It's easy. Fill out a card, and we talk about your salvation, and, and that's about it. But for the rest of you, listen, just let this be a time of where God speaks to your heart. I tried to mention it earlier, use my illustration. I don't have a bunch of these for you. So you need to pick your candle up and put it to the one next to it and light your light. And let's light this stage up as an illustration of lighting up Kirksville. Because God has put us here for a reason. To be his light to the world. So I invite you to stand with me. We'll just take our time. It might be a little bit. That's why I finished early, so that you have time to light. I invite you to come forward. As the music plays and the song's sung, I invite you to come forward, light a light. If you've got a decision to be made, Charles and I are down front. Come. Come now.